Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending upon when you are watching this, right? We are going to cover index and scales. The first slide you saw me go back to, to this introductory slide, is because we we're about to ask you a question. So be prepared to an answer that question. All right. So let's get right into it. This week we are learning how to accurately and reliably measure the concepts or the concept we choose to study. We're covering this because we're covering this because we want to know an idea of what's important of knowing how to build the questions into a study so that we might be able to create an index or a scale when we get to the data analysis stage. Now, don't get too bogged down, right, um, when you're trying to figure out what the details now, as there is a lot still to learn about the various data collections and analysis methods to continue coming forward, right? Yet, when developing a research study, we would want to think about all of this ahead of time before we actually collect the data so that we can do this properly, right? So we set up our research study in a way that gives us information we need to answer the research questions. So, now to the slide we were on when we first started. Let's start off with a question, shall we? Now, the question reads as such. In order to achieve broad coverage of various dimensions of a concept, researchers need to make which of the following? Is it A, single observations, B, field research observations, C, multiple obs observations, sorry, or B, none of the above? Please pause your video and make your decision. And then the unpause it and I'll give you the answer. And then we'll go forward. All right, hopefully you took time to pause and we'll continue. So the correct answer here would be C, multiple observations. And this is because when we create our operational definitions to measure, we want to cover various dimensions of the concepts so that we can get a fuller understanding of the complexities of the concepts. To do this, we want multiple observations instead of just one. So for instance, if we want to measure so socioeconomic status, SES, as we say in sociology on a regular basis, right? We well, could simply ask what the individual's yearly income is. Yet, what if the person is married and is a dual earner? What makes what makes this what makes significantly less? What if one makes significantly less than their partner? Or what if they are a stay-at-home parent? Household income may yield a stronger measurement. Now it may yield a stronger measurement, but this is not going to be the only aspect that we're going to be looking at, right? And in as and Income is not the only aspect of someone's status. No, it's not. Asking about occupational status and educational attainment would yield yet even stronger results having each of those variables report overall socioeconomic status, or SES. We can also construct indexes on scales to measure a concept using multiple, multiple data points. An index is constructed by simply accurately scoring assigned to an individual attribute across multiple items, and a scale is a bit more involved as it assigns scores to patterns of responses. Re recognizing that some of the items reflect a weaker degree of the variables, while others have a more strongly related one than this. So as you can see here, what does it say, right? We're looking at SES and other attributes around it, right, like we were just talking about. And as I was just mentioning what an index is, it's important to have an understanding of this as well as scale, as we were just covering, as these are different variations of understanding the process of building this research process. So let's talk about constructing an index, shall we? Now, both indexes and scales rank order the unit of analysis in terms of specific variables, and both are measurements based on more than just one data item. So on a survey, this could be ranking individual responses based on their different answers about items such as attributes or behaviors about a specific construct, right? Great. So the steps for constructing an index include first selecting the items for a, com for a composite index, right? Composite index, which simply means a combined index of data items then examining the items for empirical relationships that make sense and can predict each other's responses. Do the items make sense? Face validity, right? Are they, are and are they all related to just one concept you want to measure? Assigning score for responses and decide whether to give equal weight to each item. 
handle any missing data in this situation, such as if the participant answered some items you've chosen for the index, but not all of them. You could choose to exclude any cases with missing data from this index completely so that they are not included in the process of analysis, right? You could also code the missing data as an as available responses and analyze to it to interpret meaning, especially if you notice patterns such as multiple people skipping the same question on a survey or refusing to answer the interview question and then validating the index using internal or external validation measures. So there's a lot of processes here. Now I wanna make a little quick note for you to know. When we were running, myself, I should say we, I, not we, my company, there were so many times that we would do large scale analysis for various huge multi -stage stages, organization, not for profit and for profit corporations. And when we would use data collection tools such as Qualtrics and then import in them into SPSS, a lot of my job was cleaning that data and deciding whether we were going to use these answers or not use these answers. Because when you pay for panel survey data through online distributors, you run into a lot of fast raters, people who are quickly going through, people who are paid to take surveys so they manipulate it and don't answer the questions properly. So it's important to have an understanding of how we're going to utilize this data is it either exclude it, include it, and validate the information as needed as necessary, right? So this is the very important dynamic. Now, if running a quantitative, meaning numbers, right? Data analysis, validation scores can be obtained to test how much or little the items connect with each other. When I was running surveys, as mentioned, to obtain information on companies' member databases for large nonprofit organizations, I would be coding results that had been captured via surveys with collection services, as mentioned before, like Qualtrics, and then exported to data analysis tools like SPSS through Qualtrics. The question would be fairly simple, and usually we're based on seven-point Likert scale questions, quantita quantitative data or quantitative quantifiable data. Right, the and then the questions were usually pertaining to the way the recent poll, political opinion, piece, or speech slash issue being talked about at the time impacted their views and connections to the organization as a whole. Right, the members were asked to rate their feelings: one, meaning strongly disagree slash disagree, to seven, strongly agree slash approve, of the message or the circumstances, or an article broadcast. There would be other passion point questions, because I gauge this a lot in my organization, these passion point questions. And this would lead us to having more understanding, but these two were used to engage their involvement and their moral beliefs, which would create an index for us to measure their donor patterns and behaviors. And if their beliefs and values would match the company's long-term or short-term goals and ability to make these groups show purpose and importance, right? The data would allow us to add scores to the internal index that could show the members or the general sample could be properly marketed to for donations or engagement. These ideas show the scales construction involves assigning scores to the pattern responses. Now, there are several different types of scales that have different ways of adding up scores. We'll go kind of into that now, right? So just for TLDR for your vision here, we can look at some examples of how you would do this, right? Parent-child communications, 12 questions, each with five possible Likert scales answers. You could use this as an example, correct, right? And now we're gonna talk about the importance of these Likert scalings, right? <clears throat> now Likert scalings use standardized responses categories to measure how much someone agrees or disagrees with a statement, such as ranges from one to two, three, four, five, six, and seven. <laughs> Semantic differential scaling asks respondents to rank answers before two extremes, right? So it may give you a topic and then provide you adjectives to describe these topics, yeah? Now, like I've mentioned with my work in the past, when I was working for think tanks, this would be a way for us to assess members' views of the laws versus the old laws and allowed, in, allowed for in the moment or relatively fresh views of upcoming political speeches before they were even given. Super useful to gain and understand the zeitgeist of what is going on right now, correct? So the participants would choose which adjectives best described it. I think the grading is fair, right? Strongly agree, agree, neither, disagree, strongly, agree, strongly disagree. And I think that the grading is fair to unfair. The first one is the Likert scale. 
and the second one is the semantic differential. While these are similar, only only the, <laughs> while these are similar, one gives one uh, only one option, fair to visualize it, while the other gives terms fair and unfair. You could use an ask a question about feelings towards groups of people rating the follow, right? In general, people are friendly, rude, good, bad, helpful, and selfish, and the like, right? So this plays into how you can start constructing this types of understanding. So as we're going forward, we're now going to talk about the Bogardus social distance scale. So the, the Bogardus social distance scale measures the willingness of people to participate in social relations by asking a series of questions, whether all the options that come before to the next one are expected and included in the answer. How likely are you to talk to someone of a different country of origin? How likely are you to be neighborly with someone from a different country of origin? How likely are you to marry someone of a different country of origin, right? If you chose the last one, it is implied that you would also talk with and be neighbors too. So the Thurston scale uses judgments to determine to the intensity of the different indicators, which becomes differently important, right? So as I mentioned, determine the intensity of different indicators that are then used in a survey, potentially. This type of scale isn't often used because it would be quite intensive to find people to judge the indicators first. Now, this becomes important to look at because we're going to now talk about the Gutman scale, right? The Gutman scaling type uses an empirically in empirical intensity structure, which is the most common. The goal is to summarize the data in a way that provides a more useful description of the overall concept. Now, Babby's example on using Gutman scaling as opposed to simply creating an index when it comes to opinions on abortion in the sample he uses shows that scales can show the intensity of the response better, right? The type of scale is specific to the sample due to the error that can occur by assigning intensity scores that don't match accurately, that don't act actually or accurately match the respondent's intended responses. So for index scales, we are simply adding up the items and scale gives us much more information on the intensity of the responses, how likely or unlikely, how far or close how much do they agree or disagree? If a person agrees with one item, well, it is likely they will agree with all of the other less intense items that come before it. So it kind of starts playing that game of understanding. And then finally, typology. All right, we talked about scales, we talked about this, but we get to the final part here, which is typology, right? Finally, a typology, or as in sociology, it's a love language. <laughs> Just joking, that's an inside sociology joke but it's like the muse of sociology. And I digress. Finally, a typology is usually the nominal measurement level, right? The nominal measure level, which takes two or more variables and combines their attributes. These can be helpful for independent variables when you have a couple different dimensions of your concepts you want to measure that are empirically linked. Let's say we see patterns that arise that lead us to believe that younger men are more likely than older men to engage in risky behavior. It's tied back to our past lecture. Yet we also notice that the younger women are less likely to engage in risk behavior than older men. Interesting. We want to learn if these are correlations here. We make a typology for, for our independent variable, IV, right, based on both gender and nominal measures for age. Younger men, younger women, women older men, older women. So again, that's younger male-bodied men, younger female-bodied women, and older male-bodied men, and older female-bodied women, right? We can now test assumptions to see if there are differences in risky behavior based on the typology. So you start seeing that we can start using these cross comparisons and typologies to be able to gain an even broader understanding. So it gets deeper and deeper with this, these things. And that's what I love about the idea of research methods. Uh, I alluded to in the end of last lecture that there is stories in data. Data is a story-driven platform, in my opinion. And maybe you'll never share this opinion, but this is someone who came from market research, right? So as we look forward, as we understand all the things that we're covering, remember, there's stories in this, the numbers in the in-person interviews, if you're doing quad versus qual, right? It's your job to tell the story, but accurately, right? I want you to remember that as you're doing this. Don't finagle the data. People do this. They're called pollsters show what's really there because that's more interesting, right? Why did it come to this? How did you get this solution, Professor McQueen? Why, wow, this is crazy, right? We've covered a lot of material in this section. Please remember that 
We are learning this information now because we need to be able to think about how we might want to construct our variables. We need to know ahead of time what we want to measure. And if we don't use items or, or that can be combined into index scales or typologies, we won't be able to analyze the way if we don't collect data, right? Later in the course, we will discuss the quantitative and the qualitative data analysis, which is the point in research process where we would actually make these composite variables. Now, I will see you next lecture. And as always, ka chao. And I hope you have a wonderful day. I'll see you in next lecture.